I can notice that you have had two long days full of talks. Um, I will try to make my talk easy on the mind, but I well, hopefully I will succeed, because we have some challenging concepts maybe to discuss. Uh, but I'll do my best, of course. Um, this talk is all about the hexagon. And, well, I hope you will know everything about it at the end. And if not, ask me some questions about it. Um, the title is Hexagonal Architecture, and that may make you wonder about uh, architecture itself and your application's architecture, and maybe also what would be the problem with that. Uh, if I'm saying hexagonal architecture, I'm, I'm pointing at a particular way of designing your applications, and um, you might be wondering what may be wrong with your current ar application's architecture. Um, any reasons why you should change that? Well, let's start with how every project starts, um, with a nice app, a nice application. Um, everybody's still happy, you're working maybe on your own, which might make you even more happy about it, uh, because you can do anything in the exact way that you like it. But then some people start joining your team, and maybe you even have to leave your own team, uh, and let all the decisions be made by the other team members at that point. And maybe they don't get your idea of the structure that you had, uh, in mind for your application. So at some point in the history of your, of your project, it becomes quite a sad app because everybody starts using um, distant parts of the application here and there and just starts grabbing everything all over the place. And so, well, this kind of application, your brain can't handle it anymore and you start looking for some structural principles. Maybe you want to, to apply MVC more strictly to your application, where you have everything related to models, like entities, value objects in one place. Then you have everything related to views, like uh, templates, for example, or view models in another place. And of course, everything that's in between those things can be considered controllers in some way. So you put those in a controller directory, right? Um, this is what oftentimes happens. I'm not really sure if it's a good way to architect your application, because it's basically putting the same kind of things in the same directories. Uh, and also, MVC is more like a, a client-side facing structure for applications, because uh, MVC, as you may know, is meant to have uh, an observer pattern, where the view uh, updates its own data based on changes in the model, and the controller will make some directing moves there. Uh, but why does everybody use MVC as the governing structure for their applications? That's because many frameworks tell you to do so, at least in their documentation. They explain you how to structure your application in an MVC style uh, of coding. Um, so that makes your application quite coupled to uh, the framework that you use itself. Uh, this is very much apparent when you look at, at projects or hear people uh, talk about projects and starting new ones. Uh, because how do you do this? Well, you pick a framework, either Symfony or Laravel maybe, or Zen framework. You install a skeleton project, you remove all the stuff that you don't need, the demo stuff. Uh, and you just start using the command line to generate entities and controllers sometimes even. Uh, and you're done. And you call this project, for example, a Symfony project. Mm. To me, that's actually outside in. Because all of these details, the Symfony uh, framework itself, or maybe you use Doctrine, or um, Eloquent, uh, RabbitMQ for messaging, Angular for front-end JavaScript, Redis for some key value stores, um, that's, that's boring stuff really. The interesting stuff, or at least the things that will make your client the most happy about your project, will be inside, uh, hidden somewhere behind the layer of, well, infrastructural stuff, about which I'll tell you later. Um, this approach to developing applications leads, in the first place, to slow tests. Uh, and I'm sure you recognize this in some way. If you just follow the documentation, like, like Symfony's documentation, um, you write your controllers in that way, uh, you just uh, talk directly to Doctrine for your uh, data, <coughs> and maybe to the file system to store some things, um, then if you want to test all of those very crucial parts of your application, you have to instantiate every surrounding system, or server, or files, etc. Um, and that will make your tests very slow, because real-life things are usually quite slow, uh, as opposed to unit tests, where unit tests can be very fast, of course. Um, 
So why do frameworks not solve this problem for us? Why don't they make our tests faster? Right? Well, because they can't. Um, frameworks are all about encapsulation, and they do a very good job <coughs> of this. So this is an image of encapsulation. <laughs> but just some code samples for that. Um, this is very low-level, detailed stuff. We take uh, the request contents, or the body of the request, um, by reading from the PHP input stream. And then we analyze the server variables to find out what content type the current request was. And if it was application JSON, then we JSON decode the request content, right? And if it was XML, then we need to do some more steps. <coughs> Anyhow, this is pretty low-level stuff for exactly PHP and how it requests request. Um, frameworks and libraries offer encapsulation in this case. So it calls uh, this thing a serializer and a request object, and well, it just facilitates some easy steps and hides some of the low-level implementation details for us. And the same for handling database calls, where, uh, for example, if we use PDO, we have to do things like this. We, in this case, select all anonymous patients from the database. We have to bind a value, we have to execute the statement, and then fetch it using a particular argument here, the fetch associati associative array, uh, and then maybe reconstitute an object from that array. Uh, this is all very low-level, detailed stuff. Um, so now we have uh, libraries like Doctrine, which help us to, uh, to work with, um, with databases in a much simpler way, because they, um, Doctrine itself hides a lot of these details uh, about SQL queries, executing statements, binding values, etc. So it, it, it hides all of that work for us. Um, but what about abstraction? Uh, if you look at this, this piece of code, it's still very concrete. It's still talking about a repository which uh, makes a query to a database. So the database is the word that's missing in this code. It's very um, apparent that, that, in fact, the database is going to be used to fetch this data. Because where p anonymous equals true, that's, that's database language, right? And get query. That's particularly database language and get resolved also. Um, so this is still very concrete, even though the low-level details have been hidden from sight using encapsulation. Uh, we are in fact looking for something more abstract, like a repository with patients. In this example, you can see that a repository just represents um, a storage for objects. So it's a collection of objects that you can retrieve in this case, anonymous patients from it very easily. And this doesn't tell you anything about what's behind this repository. Is it a database, a file system? You don't know. Uh, and that's a very good thing. But of course, frameworks, frameworks cannot supply these kinds of abstractions for us. We always have to do this ourselves. We have to think about what kind of abstractions we are, need, we are in need of, and we have to define them ourselves. More about this later. <laughs> Um, another problem, problem of uh, following, in fact, uh, or Symfony or any other frameworks uh, documentation in writing applications is that you're coupling your code very strictly to the delivery mechanism. And an example of this is, well, this very regular, uh, probably very recognizable controller or action where uh, everything that happens here is coupled to some kind of delivery mechanism. Uh, in the first case, we can see that there's a request object and a form. Both are very much HTTP or web-specific um, concepts. Uh, and the same goes for Entity Manager, which is part of the ORM, and it can only be used with relational databases. So that's one particular way to couple your code to the, the delivery mechanism for uh, persisting your objects. Uh, a problem of this, this type of uh, coding, even though register patient is a very crucial action in our application, is that reusability is quite impossible. And I'm not talking about reusability, like um, distributing the code to other uh, companies, maybe, or other people who would like to use the code, but uh, reusability within the same application. Because, well, this controller is coupled to the web, or the web as a delivery mechanism. You can see that uh, a request is coming in, some functionality is being executed. Um, but if we would like to do the same thing from a different angle, for example, from the command line interface, then that would be totally impossible because we don't have a request object at the command line, and we cannot use forms there. And the same goes for the situations where we might want to run the same functionality in a loop. So if we have a batch uh, script, which in our example registers patients from some kind of a CSV file, for example, then we would like to run the same functionality again and again and again, maybe a thousand times in a row. Uh, 
But, of course, this is impossible because it's a controller. It has to be instantly instantiated by the HTTP kernel in the case of Symfony. Uh, and it's just a run this one time only. Um, one of the biggest problems with uh, the kind of controller code that I showed you uh, is that there is a lack of intention in that code. The code there doesn't reveal any of the intentions that the user had while they submitted the form. Uh, and so your application starts to look something like this. You may have different layers, of course, like a view layer, a controller, and maybe some model layer. Uh, but it's still about copying data from layer to layer. And you don't know why this is happening. You don't know what happened in the real world that caused the change uh, to be submitted to your application. Looking at the update action um, for the patient, you want to change some information about the patient. Uh, data is copied from the HTTP request uh, right into the entity using form as a helper. And then, again, copied to the database. That's just a one-to-one -one corresponding uh, copy mechanism. Uh, we might be left wondering, why did this change ever occur? What did the user try to do with this? Did they just change one field? Were they allowed to change one field, or should they have changed an entire address, maybe? Uh, questions like that. This, this totally is uh, void of user's intention. And if you follow these uh, practices, like writing controller code like this, uh, this leads to rapid application development, of course. So you're, you're done very quickly, and you have a nice application. You can get back to your client and say, oh, this, this, this all works, right? Uh, in my opinion, RAD often leads to bad application development, uh, which is a recursive acronym. So the B stands for bad itself, just like in PHP. In summary, what are the issues currently with, well, lots of uh, CRUD-style uh, code writing for framework applications? Coupling to a framework, of course, so you cannot reuse the same code uh, even within the same application, because you're also coupled to the delivery mechanism, for example, the web. Something is either a web functionality or a console functionality. You have slow tests because you need to instantiate all kinds of surrounding services, and there is a lot of lack of intention in the code. You don't know why something happens, it just happens. Yeah. To find out how we can improve this, we have to get back to the essence of our application and sort of reinvent our application's design. Yeah. This is what the essence looks like it's a blue circle. Uh, and there are other things surrounding it. Uh, and those are not the essential things, they are the surrounding things. And there are different words for the essence. Uh, for example, core is a word that is often used for this particular part of your application. And you can also call it the heart of your application. And maybe this does ring a bell, some of you, uh, because of this book. Uh, quite a famous book about domain-driven design. And the subtitle of this book is Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. That's very interesting. In the introduction, Eric Evans tells us that the heart of software is its ability to solve domain-related problems for its users. And all other features, vital though they may be, support this basic purpose. So according to Eric Evans, what would be essential to your application? What would, what would be in the core of your application? Uh, that would be the domain model. And this can consist of entities, value objects, combined in aggregates, like you may know from the subject material uh, of domain-driven design. And then these entities can undergo some changes, so there are possible interactions with it. And together, these objects, they constitute <laughs> use cases. And thereby, the essence of your application defines every way in which your application can be used by a user. Um, that's what's, what's essential about your application. So what's not essential? Any of the surrounding techniques that you use to store data, to accept data, anything like that. Or like the cool software architect tells us, the database is an implementation detail. Because, in fact, the core, the essence, doesn't need to know about it at all in order to function properly. But what about interaction? If we just consider the domain model as the core of our application, and of course every interaction that's defined with it, we still have to allow users to interact with the domain model itself. Um, but unfortunately users cannot interact with objects directly, so we have to provide something for them 
uh, some way in which they can influence the state of our application. Um, that's all good. That we, we are going to do this, of course. But again, the core doesn't need to know about this. So what do we do? Uh, we look at the world outside. We have the core. Uh, it's still happy, right? Uh, and we wrap it inside a layer called infrastructure. And in that layer, we define every way in which the application can communicate with the world outside. Uh, so this is about both communication into the application and outside to the outside world. Uh, well, of course, uh, the web is one way to get into our application. Uh, maybe the terminal is another way to get into it. There are some relations with the file system. Uh, the file system is an actual concrete thing out there in the world outside. And the same, is for, uh, the same goes for messaging queues or actual, uh, actual databases. And also, of course, email or maybe just postal, postal mail. Um, those are links to the world outside that the core still doesn't need to know anything about. Uh, because, well, or how would we achieve this? By adding layers. And of course, the infrastructure layer is a layer on itself. But we can add more layers to separate these concerns a little bit better. What's so good about layers? is that they allow you to separate things. Well, that's nothing new, of course. Uh, but what's also interesting about layers, and this in particular helps a lot if your application is layered, uh, because if you're walking around with some piece of code and you don't know where to put it, I'm sure this happens all day to you, it does to me, uh, then layers allow you to um, find out, or help you to find out where to put that thing. Because every layer has its own description of things related to that layer. Um, layers by their pure existence have some kind of boundaries, and this helps you to define rules for crossing those boundaries. In case messages have to be passed around, then you can define in which direction this is allowed to happen. For example, looking at this diagram, uh, messages can pass from one layer to another, but not back. Right? So this turns out to be that actual rules of communication are rules about dependencies. Um, and this is one thing that I'd like to define here, because it's important for a hexagonal architecture as well. Uh, it's called the dependency rule. It's um, named like that by Robert Martin, who writes about the screaming architecture, which is very much related to a hexagonal architecture. Uh, you can read it, well, not now, but afterwards, if you download the slides. The dependency rule tells us that given uh, the application, which is a layered one, we can only have dependencies going inwards, well, or in the same layer at least. Uh, so you can ne never have something inside the essence of your application, the core, pointing outwards. Right? So it is a very simple rule, but it's, it can be sometimes very hard to apply this, but I, I'll give you some ideas about tricks that you can use to uh, make sure that you comply with this rule. Now, what crosses boundaries, or what crosses these um, layers boundaries? Uh, those are messages. I already mentioned it, and I mentioned it yesterday in my talk that you could, should consider objects calling other objects uh, as communication going on. So messages are being passed around. And messages can be seen as function calls, for example. Like in this case, there is a function, which will be the type of the message. And then a set of arguments prepared for the receiver, uh, which is actually the value of this particular message. Uh, we can remodel this a bit by putting all the, the arguments in one object, in fact, making it one, uh, one big argument. And then instead of calling a, a specific function, maybe call somewhat of an anonymous function, which dispatches the call to other functions or objects. Now, what about the, uh, the application's boundary itself? Uh, so there has to be some touching points with the world outside again. Uh, what crosses the boundary of the application is still a message. It's going in, it's coming in in some way or another. Uh, but how does the app really allow this to happen? Well, this is by exposing input ports. So the application um, determines ways in which other things out there can talk to it. And when you're used to writing simply applications, you can think about uh, routes, for example. Whether you define them as annotations or in YAML, it doesn't matter. Uh, having a route in your application means you're exposing an input port to the world outside. In that way, an application can be seen as an object hiding its own internals and only allowing certain other uh, parties to, to enter it. Uh, the same goes for console commands. If you define a console command or add a console command, then that is one way to expose an input port for that application. 
Um, well, if you worked with soap, <coughs> would it? By the way, quite a lot. Uh, then you know about the whistle file. Uh, it uh, tells you which input ports an application has to use. So those are different ways of exposing your application to the world outside. And this is where we can consider the hexagon itself again. So so far we have um, uh, we have looked at the application as a circle, right? And now we can continue looking at it like it is a hexagon, because input ports can be seen as well either of the sides on either end of the, of the hexagon, doesn't really matter. Uh, but every port is represented as one side of this hexagon. So now you might wonder why does it have six sides? Who's wondering? <laughs> right, still quite a lot. Um, <laughs> there's no good reason for this actually. <laughs> it just looks nice. And um, yeah, sorry. Um, it said that, that probably the average number of ports on an application are about six. So that's it. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, if you know, I can make you happy maybe with a nice image of, uh, of a wallpaper like this. Uh, I'm, I'm also a bit kidding, because it's nice if you have a landscape of um, applications, for example, a whole system of applications, then you can actually draw each of the applications as one hexagon in this kind of a diagram, because every application's input board basically receives information from another application's output board. Right? So you can draw these lines connecting the applications in your well, in your <coughs> so that's nice. What's good to know about ports is that they use protocols for communication. Of course, uh, you cannot just start talking to any application's input port. Uh, you have to comply to some kind of a standard, or else the application might not know what you're talking about. Uh, and so each port has a language of its own. Uh, for example, the web port speaks HTTP, of course. Um, maybe there's a messaging port which sends messages to a queue or some kind of exchange, and then this uh, output port communicates using AMQP. Uh, if you have a MySQL database, it communicates using SQL queries. Right? Um, zooming in on the web port a bit, you can see that the, well, whenever an HTTP request is coming in, of course PHP has some things to do with this, uh, your web server of course has to do some things with it, but we ignore this for now. We look just at your application, as in your PHP application. As it enters the web port, there has to be some translation before you can actually do something with it. Uh, inside the controller, maybe a form is used, a request object is used, and, and some, in some way um, uh, the message is being translated to something that's understandable inside, in the core, where entities are being changed, uh, maybe using value objects, and there is something persisted using a repository. Um, and these things are called adapters. So whenever some message comes in through a port, then the message has to be translated, and it has to be done by an adapter. And this adapter is not really um, an implementation of the adapter pattern. It's just the set of everything that's, that's needed, or every service that is needed, to find out what the external user or external system meant to change in your system. And this is also where the alias for hexagonal architecture comes from, ports and adapters, um, which is also maybe a good moment to mention that I'm not the inventor of all this. Of course, uh, it's Alastair Cockburn. He wrote about this, he talked about this, um, and it's a very uh, relevant idea. So it's always good to talk about it. So in summary, ports allow for communication to happen, and adapters translate messages from the world outside, uh, and also to messages for the world outside. Well, looking at the web port, maybe in a bit more detailed way, uh, talking about patients again, if we want to register them in our system, we get a plain HTTP message uh, saying which is the URI we post to and which is the data that we want to post. <coughs> then an adapter converts all kinds of things about this, all kinds of aspects, using maybe global variables or a request object, uh, and turns it into uh, a message, command message in this case, register patient with the given data. Um, in order to be able to process it again in a deeper layer of the system. Uh, so let's zoom in on the command also. Uh, what's good about the command is that it <coughs> brings back all the attention that we lost when we allow people to just uh, submit some form and we just copy that to the database. So now we know what the user is trying to do. They are trying to register themselves as a patient using their name and email. 
A command also implies change, which is important, because now we know that at some point when the command is being handled, uh, there will be also some change in our system. The change will be persistent, and the next time the user comes back, the change will, will still be known. Um, what's also good about commands is that these are independent of the de delivery mechanisms. So we have basically stripped all the things that are related to the web, like forms and, re and requests, uh, and now we have a command object, uh, which is free of those details, and can be constructed in either way, using the web, uh, in a web controller, or maybe even from the command line, where you have a console command, which creates this object. It doesn't really matter where the object comes from anymore. Also, it's good to note that this is just the, the message itself, uh, and it does not do anything like handling itself or something. Uh, therefore, we introduce a command handler, which is able to do the action that is necessary to perform or to uh, comply to the intention of the user. Like in this case, the register patient handler accepts the register patient command, uh, extracts the data from it, and creates a patient entity. And then it adds the, this patient entity to the registry. Um, usually, we have a command bus in between there. And this is mostly just to separate the concern of finding out which handler to, to call. Uh, you can use simple bus, which I created as a, an open source library for this. It's already simple, so you, you, you don't even have to use such a library. There are, of course, alternatives to that, like a tactician by the league. Um, so this is just a detail, really. It's more about the big picture, of course. So again, uh, zoom in a bit, and we introduce another layer before we continue. We have HTTP requests coming in to the web port. We have the infrastructure layer, which is concerned about translating the web requests to something that can be handled in the core of our application. Then we have an application layer, which contains all the use case code necessary to uh, call methods on repositories, for example, to retrieve a patient, and also on the entity to maybe update it in some relevant way. Um, then we continue to the other end of the hexagon, where change has to occur. Because now we have a patient entity, uh, we want to add it to the repository, and of course, this has to be persistent in some way. So let's use uh, Doctrine ORM, right? We have an entity manager, it uses some unit of work to calculate the changes, it needs to persist, and then at some point, SQL queries uh, roll out of that. Um, so in this case, for example, insert into patients, uh, and then some values, of course. Uh, so looking at the big picture again, we have the core, it contains the patient repository, it uses some stuff from the infrastructure layer, like uh, entity manager, unit of work, query bill maybe, uh, and it prepares for persistence by generating messages that can be sent to somewhere outside our application. The world outside also contains a MySQL database, luckily for us. Uh, zooming out a bit again, this is one of the output ports of our application, so we can match it exactly with one of the ports of the application. Uh, like we have messaging as a port, persistence is also a port. Um, so now, um, I tricked you somehow, uh, because I actually failed to comply to the dependency rule. Uh, did anyone notice? Aha! <laughs> very, very clever. Uh, even at this time, you know, the day and the conference. Good. So, yes, what often goes wrong is we violate these rules um, of crossing boundaries. So, I said that patient repository was part of the core, and that it used parts that are in the infrastructure here like entity managing units of work, which are related to MySQL databases. As you can see, the arrow, the dependency arrow, is actually going from the inside to the outside, um, which is contrary or opposed to the dependency rule, which says we can only depend on things in a deeper layer, right, or in the same layer. So that's not allowed. Mm. <coughs> it's not so nice. Um, also, we need to make the picture a bit uh, better, because we also had introduced the application layer, which contained the register patient handler, which was, in turn, depending on the patient repository, which uses MySQL, which uses stuff from the infrastructure layer. So this is still not right. We are still pointing outwards. Um, so where does the patient repository, which uses MySQL as a persistent mechanism, belong? And which layer does it belong? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. That's right. So let's move it over there. Um, ah, still, still not good. Right? We are still depending on something that is in, in an outside uh, layer. Um, who knows the trick for this? 
dependency inversion principle. Ah, very good, very good. Dependency inversion. Um, it means that we have to just find an abstract concept which we can put in a deeper layer, and then we can make sure that, that everything in the outside is implementing that abstract concept, or in, a, in the case of PHP, an interface. So the register patient handler should depend on the patient repository interface, which is in uh, the domain layer. And then we can have any kind of implementation for that in the infrastructure layer. And we still comply to the dependency rule using uh, this trick. Or trick, it's not really a trick, um, because it's one of the basic principles of programming. Uh, in fact, it is also represented as the D from solid principles. So if you're interested, uh, I, I recommend reading about this subject. Um, this also helps us to solve the, the problem of having all these slow tests. Uh, because what well, we used previously, a MySQL depending patient repository. So we had to have an actual database. Uh, I know that functional tests often use an SQLite database, <coughs> so stand in for, a, for an actual MySQL database to make it a little bit faster. Um, but still, it's not the real deal, so you're testing something that, that doesn't really represent what will be in production. Um, so instead, we can step away from that idea and uh, replace the MySQL-related repository, or MySQL-oriented repository, with an in-memory repository, which just stores the objects, the patient objects, in memory. And that can be really fast, of course. Um, and now, if we inject the in-memory patient repository in the patient handler, or the registered patient handler, we can have very fast tests for that particular um, application service, registered patient handler. Um, applying dependency inversion in these ways uh, makes us also comply to a rule that Robert Martin, again, <laughs> describes in his article, Screaming Architecture. A good software architecture allows decisions to be deferred and delayed. Um, and this is something that we can definitely do. So now, once we have these, uh, for example, repository interfaces in our domain layer, and we have all the implementation details in the infrastructure layer, we can even decide not to implement an actual repository, uh, before we know which persistence mechanism that we are really going to choose. Uh, so we can actually wait a little bit longer before deciding to go with either MongoDB or MySQL as a database, or any of the flavors that are out there. Um, so that's a really useful thing. And of course, well, that, that's, that's the thing I just mentioned. Uh, your tests can be very fast, because you can test many things with just uh, in-memory standards. That's very useful. So, in conclusion, uh, what do we get from all of this, taking all of these steps? Well, one thing that's always very important, of course, when you're designing your application, we have a very clear separation of concerns. We have the core, which knows nothing about the world outside, and we have an infrastructure layer, which contains all the required implementations to make it connect to the world, to give it, so to say, hands and feet, and eyes and ears. Um, using commands and command handlers, we can have um, standalone reusable use cases in our application, uh, which also, of course, reveal any of the intention that the user had when they submitted some request to our website uh, or typed in some command, of course. Uh, then we can have infrastructure stand ins, like fast implementations or maybe alternative implementations, uh, which allow you to try out different strategies for persisting uh, or for message queuing. Uh, the funny thing is, although this is this is really nice in itself, uh, like I'm sure you will agree with me, this is all very much supportive of several different things that you can do to your application. Uh, for example, uh, if you're using less of these these coupled stuff, then you can have better um, uh, unit tests. So you, you don't have to instantiate all kinds of things. Uh, it's much easier to just test little pieces of code in isolation, um, and then for the, for the pieces of code that uh, are application services, like the registered patient handler, uh, you can much more easily test them using uh, a BDD. Uh, you can write scenarios for them, uh, and using a technique called modeling by example, by uh, the creator of, of the app. It's an article you can, you can click on it once you get the slides. Um, <coughs> this suggests to run your tests for the application layer, uh, a first round without any of the infrastructure stuff enabled. So you can just run the core of your application uh, and see if it works for a potential user, and then run it again 
uh, with all, everything enabled, which is part of infrastructure usually. So maybe a database, maybe uh, an actual web interface, maybe using HTML pages, or maybe even with JavaScript enabled. Um, and this allows you to test big parts of your application functionally without all the slowness of actually persistent stuff. Uh, and of course, at some point, you would have to test the, the actual persistence, but that's a different story. Uh, then using commands is mm, one step in the direction of, of applying CQRS as, um, as a well, design principle to your application. Uh, of course, you don't have to, but if you're doing this, you're one step in that direction. Um, and, well, most obvious of all, if you want to apply domain-driven design to applications, um, a hexagon or hexagonal architecture is, uh, is one way in which you can support this to happen. And of course, a DDD doesn't want to do anything with uh, the frameworks that you're using. So it already pushes those to the side uh, in itself, or by itself. Um, I think that's it. So we can look at some questions, maybe, by you. Go ahead. That's it. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. So you uh, showed us a, a typical implementation of a, a symphony controller. And um, you, uh, you didn't mention how you would cope in a, a hexagonal scenario where to get the, um, the the object you want to change, for example, for the update procedure, because mm -hmm. there must be some kind of feature within your core which provides a person or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, makes it possible that you don't <coughs> need to uh, request um, doctrine or whatever. So what's your su suggestion about <coughs> uh, getting symphony uh, cope with that problem without making everything different than it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the question is about the practical implementation of uh, the update action, really. Um, so how, how would you go about this? And um, yeah, of course you need to provide some ID of the patient that you want to update, in this case. Uh, but it, it, it already starts with what exactly are you going to update? Uh, because the form doesn't show every little field of the patient. Uh, it's, it's probably more use case oriented. Uh, so maybe you want to move the patient to a different room, then the command would be um, move patient to room. And you just provide the ID of the patient and the ID of the, the room. Right? Um, then in the command handler, you can use the repository to fetch any number of objects that you would need to, uh, to modify. So call the methods on them. Um, and then, yes, of course, you have to have some mechanism which detects whether or not to um, save anything. Um, and yeah, that, that is where um, libraries like Signalbus and also Tactician uh, help you. So uh, after handling the command, they basically close a transaction or commit a transaction. Uh, and then they maybe catch some events, dispatch them. Uh, but this, this of course goes into a lot, a lot more detail um, because I, I just wanted to cover the big picture. Uh, you can find some more about this on my blog, which contains examples of, of the exact flow that you would follow. Uh, and also some examples of how to solve these issues. It's basically uh, the, the solution will be that you will have a transaction, you open it before you start it, before handling the command, you listen for any changes, uh, which will be collected, of course, by doctrine in this case, uh, committed afterwards, and, and that's it really. Okay. Thank you. Yes? One more thing. Uh, we are using DDT in our project, but the question is, what uh, do you need to do when you need to return the result by uh, calling those commands? I know that some cases you are always uh, throw an exception. I mean, uh, but so basically uh, you need to return uh, the result of operation for caching and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the question is about um, getting the result of an operation. Yeah. Uh, and there are many different opinions about this. Uh, if we're talking about simple bus, uh, it doesn't allow any return value. Uh, so it's just the command handler does its job, and you assume it's it's, it's done. Right. So this this is a little bit of a rethinking because usually you would uh, listen for some return value and start acting upon that. Um, that's not not allowed anymore. Uh, but this allows you to eventually um, uh, uh, cut your application. 
And instead of handling the message right now, or the command, or, or anything, uh, and instead uh, offload it to some uh, well, asynchronous consumer of the message. Uh, so that's, that's uh, a design principle that uh, really helps. Um, yes, sir, yeah. but, but this was actually uh, make the architecture more complex because sometimes when you have JSON handlers, so uh, uh, you need to initiate this other way interaction from server to client side, and then you're mm -hmm. not using something like Rocket or other uh, frameworks on this home server and yep. work. <coughs> right. So you're saying this, this complicates things a lot, um, uh, and yeah, it, 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 it depends, uh, of course. Um, I must say that you don't have to to do all of this. So this command and command handler stuff, uh, command buses, you know, it, it, that is one particular way in which you can start doing hexagonal, and it's easier to do hexagonal because you have this uh, logic or um, uh, natural split between the web and what's going on in the core. But you don't have to do it like this. Uh, it's more like keeping in mind that you you have a, 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 a direct cut between two layers. Uh, the infrastructure layer and the core. That's really the, the most important distinction there. Uh, so you, you, you don't couple to the delivery mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I see it working with a nice massive things, but if I have an HTTP call, mostly I want to give an answer back. So mm -hmm. all websites, how is this concept working with yeah. this kind of systems? Um, that's no problem. Um, so you, you can just, um, well, it depends on the exact case that you're looking at, of course. Uh, but there, there's no, the request isn't cut off or something. And so in the controller, you can also say return your response uh, and render anything that you like. I don't care an answer. I mean, you said there's no response object back. So ah. I send a message, I don't get an answer. I mean, that's but, the last kernel state. Yes. So let's say I mm -hmm. ask for a user, or a change user, but I want to display the change of the user mm -hmm. in my website. So I have an API or something, I ask that the change, but I want to display the change to the app. Mm -hmm. So what do I do with that? Yeah, yeah. Curious, matter. You want to show the change? Yeah. Um, the thing is, and, and, but this is again a little bit specific to simple bus, but, uh, but okay, I, I will just uh, still answer it. Um, because, well, um, you can assume that things are being handled synchronously, and then just return uh, whatever you, maybe, maybe you have to fetch it from the repository again, like the, the latest information, and then return that. that that's, that's perfectly fine. But again, you don't have to do it like this, uh, because using command and command handlers of this style uh, already moves you quite, quite steadily in the direction of CQRS. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Um, one question there. First part, so are you asking about validation? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, validations in, in the sense of you need some domain model knowledge, mm -hmm. right? But you are doing this validation in, in the outer context, like getting the data from a request, and you need to validate it first if it fits that use case that you want yeah. to handle then in a handler, basically. Yes. Um, and this is one important thing, uh, a practical detail about uh, hexagonal architecture. It's where um, uh, every uh, input board has its own feedback mechanism. So we are very much used to using forms, uh, form validation, to, to give back some error information uh, to the user. Uh, but then the real validation happens in the core. So you have there your uh, domain objects, and, and um, you make sure that they cannot be created without being uh, uh, like perfectly valid. Uh, you make sure that every change on them is also uh, valid. Uh, and using value objects, for example, you can make sure that every detail about these, these entities is also correct. Um, so this is what I meant with um, uh, hexagonal architecture being very much supportive of uh, uh, DDD, because DDD wants to validate its own objects. Like uh, if you have your, these domain models, uh, they have to care for themselves, for their own consistency. Um, if you want to provide feedback to the user, 
you don't wait for an exception to be raised by uh, some domain object deeper in the application. You already start validating, for example, commands before they are being handed over to uh, the entity or uh, cause any change in the entity. So uh, at the command line, for, for example, if you would uh, execute the same action, you wouldn't get form errors because the command line has no form. So you would find another mechanism for this. Uh, and this usually means that you have to validate the command in itself. So you look at the values inside the command object um, and see if they have the uh, same, same values. Uh, so that, that's sort of user-oriented validation. And then deeper, there's always, always a uh, domain model validation. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, so basically you're saying we have multiple layers of validation as well, right? Yes. In each wrapper uh, or... Um... Yes. Yeah. So, uh, opposed to validation, it, how it usually happens, you have a form, you bind data to an entity, and then validate the entity once it's, it's been <coughs> populated with the, with the new data. Uh, but that's not allowed anymore, because your domain objects, like entities, they cannot be created without being, uh, being uh, consistent at all, or valid at all. Um, so, you can use Symphony Validator for command objects, not for domain objects, uh, like entities. Right? Okay. Other questions, maybe? Mm, no? Good. Thank you. And please give me some feedback on the end.